mentioning that according to the Department of Justice, in a study released in 2004, black and Latino males are three times more likely than white males to have their cars stopped and searched for drugs, even though white males are four and a half times more likely to actually have drugs on us on the occasion when we are stopped. Now think about that. Because that suggests that racial profiling is not just racist, we know that, that is redundant. But it's also pretty stupid ass law enforcement. <laughs> or is it? Because I guess it's only stupid if you think the purpose of the war on drugs is actually to get drugs off the street. Because if that were the purpose, putting aside whether or not we ought to deal with a medical and a health problem known as drug addiction with war metaphors in the first place. Different lecture for a different night. Even if we assume that that is a good policy, let us be clear that that is not what we're fighting. We're not fighting a war on drugs because the first rule of any war is to go where the enemy is. And if the white folks are the ones with the drugs in the car and the black and brown folks are the ones getting stopped, the people fighting this war are either supremely stupid or just have you know, really bad short-term memory. Like they keep forgetting, oh damn, I pulled over another guy named Martinez. I keep forgetting, it's white people, it's white people. Damn it, I gotta I got write a note and put it on the dashboard. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. Maybe that's it, you know? Or maybe it's something else. I do trainings with law enforcement, not a hell of a lot, for reasons you can probably guess. And I ask law enforcement officers, what's the first thing you think when you see a young black or Latino male driving a nice car in your neighborhood? And they all, without fail and without exception, will say drug dealer. I then ask them, what's the first thing you think when you see a young white male, same age, driving the same kind of car in that same community? And they will say, without exception, without hesitation, without fail, spoiled little rich kid, daddy probably bought him a car. Keep in mind, we have been together for about 90 seconds of the workshop at this point. We have two hours left, and they have just outed themselves as racist because what they have said is that they are making snap judgments on the basis of only color that work to the detriment of people of color, the benefit of white people. We still got two hours to go, so you know it's going to be fun from that point forward. These are people sworn to protect and to serve. It's right there on the car, right there on the side of the car. And in the first 90 seconds, they are acknowledging these racial biases. How is that not an issue? How is it not an issue that according to that Justice Department report, while black and brown folk are having their wheel wells ripped apart on the side of the road, their trunks splayed open, their dashboards ripped apart in the search for drugs which aren't even there, white people like me, notice I said like me because I'm not trying to tell you anything about me that you don't need to know and for which the statute of limitations has not yet expired are driving by the roadblock with a trunk full of weed and we're just waving because we're not suspected therefore we're not detected therefore we're not punished how is that not an issue how is it not an issue that the typical white family in america thanks to this history this legacy of institutionalized oppression for some and advantage and privilege for others how is it not news that the average white family in america not the average rich white family the average white family has 12 times the accumulated net worth of the average african-american family eight times the accumulated net worth of the average latino family in large measure because those white average families have had parents or grandparents who, even if they didn't have much, even if they were not rich, nonetheless were able to procure a little house, a little property, maybe with an FHA or a VA loan in the middle of the 20th century loans that were all but off limits to people of color as they gave hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets and equity to those who were white. So that even white working class families on average, even white families with less than 15000 a year in annual income, which depending on family size, that is technically legally the poverty limit. And yet the average white family with low income, less than 15000 has the same average net worth as a typical black family with 60000 or more in annual income. So that even those African-American families that are professional, good jobs, occupational status, good educations, etc., and pretty good incomes are still in worse shape in terms of wealth and assets, material goods, which are really what matter in the long run, your income. If you're dependent on that, you're one paycheck away from nothing. 
If you don't have assets, if you don't have wealth, if you don't have something accumulated, your income means very little in the case of an economic downturn. And these working class white families who are struggling, make no mistake about it, nonetheless are on average going to be better off than those black families with four times as much annual pay. How can that not be an issue? I am suggesting to you that the failure to talk about race, the failure to talk about racism and inequality on the basis of color feeds the denial that is already far too prevalent among the white community. And having been white all of my life, I've been surrounded by that denial for a very long time. A few years back, white Americans were asked whether or not we believed that racial discrimination was still a significant national problem for people of color, or whether it was just a problem, you know, like junk mail, <laughs> wrong phone number, two in the morning, you can't get back to sleep, it's raining and you want to go outside for a jog, you know, a problem, but one you'll get over, you know. Whether it wasn't much of a problem, wasn't a problem at all, we just weren't sure. They also asked black and brown folk this question. Folks of color, it won't surprise you, said, uh, yes, it is a significant problem, actually, and not just because I read about it in a sociology textbook. I uh, actually have lived it and would be more than happy to tell you what kind of problem it's been, but these were pollsters, man. They didn't care about that. They just wanted the yes or no, then they were on to the next house. And they asked white folks, is it or is it not a significant national problem, racial discrimination for people of color and against people of color, and only 6%. Six out of 100 said yes, that it was a significant national problem. Just to give you an idea of how bad that is, I would have you compare it to a survey taken a few years earlier where approximately 12% of white Americans said we believe there was a fairly decent chance that Elvis Presley might still be alive. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know how good you are at math. I'm, I'm not very good myself, but that's a ratio that I can calculate. What that means is that white Americans are twice as likely to believe that Elvis might still be alive than we are to believe what people of color tell us they experience on a fairly regular basis. That is denial so profound as to boggle the mind, but there it is. And the people who are saying it are not mean-spirited, they're not hard-hearted, they're not bad people. I firmly believe that most people are good people. I could be wrong about this, but I have two little girls, ages six and four, and I choose as a parent to believe that most people are good. If you have evidence of the contrary, keep it to yourself. I do not want to know it or hear it this evening. What I do know is that those individuals who said that, as well-meaning as they may have been, that they really didn't see it as a significant problem, aren't new in their denial. See, it's one thing for young people to think that the problem is solved. I almost get that. I almost understand it, because if you're under the age of 25, maybe even under the age of 35, what you know, what we tend to know, younger people, about this history and about this legacy is what we see in that grainy black and white footage every MLK day, or maybe during Black History Month. If I were to ask you, do you believe that folks of color had equal opportunity and were treated equally in this country in 1963? or whether or not black children were treated equally in schools and had equal educational opportunity in 1962, I know right now that no one in here would say, well, of course, you know, naturally they did. 1963, that was a damn good year to be black or brown in America. What are you talking about? Everyone, regardless of your position about 2007, would quickly acknowledge how bad it was back in the day because it's no sweat off your back. 44, 45 years later, it's easy to talk about how bad it was, but now see, here's the trick. What do you think white folks said when those very questions were put to them in 1963 and in 1962? At a time when the apartheid system in this country was very much in full effect. It was before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, before the Fair Housing Act. In retrospect, we can all look back and say how profoundly unequal it was how profoundly unequal it was, and yet when white folks were asked, some of them our parents, our grandparents, great uncles, great aunts, these ancestors of ours, right, were asked the very same question in 1963. Do you think that people of color, they didn't use that term, it said racial minorities. Do you think that racial minorities are treated equally in your community? And 80% of white folks said yes. In 1962, when Gallup asked, do you think that black children receive equal educational opportunity in your community? 90% approximately of white folks said yes. Nothing to see here. What is all this complaining? What is this march on Washington? I don't get it. 
I don't understand it. In fact, the very month of that march, which now it seems like every white liberal wants you to believe they were at. <laughs> the very month of that march, white folks were asked by Newsweek what they thought about it. They said two thirds of whites said that Dr. King and the movement were pushing too far, too fast, asking for too much and too soon. The idea that this country was ready to hear this, even at the time when we know how vicious it was, is a lie. What does it say that white folks were in denial in 62 and 63? What does it say that if you've gone back to the 30s and asked the question, you think white folks were clear then? The 1890s, what did white folks say? Those southern editors of newspapers where I'm from, they would say, well, we get along fine with our Negroes down here if you Yankees would just leave us alone and stop messing in our business. Go back to 1850 and read what Dr. Samuel Cartwright, a well-respected member in good standing of the medical profession in this country, said not only was racism not a problem, there wasn't even a word for that yet, slavery wasn't a problem, so much so that he decided that any slave who would run away obviously had a mental illness. Because you'd have to be crazy to run away from bondage. So he came up with a term, he called it drapedomania. Don't even know what the root of that is, don't want to know, don't understand where the word came from, but that's what he called it, drapedomania. You must be crazy, you must be mentally ill to run away from your loving master. Denial. In every generation, 2007, 1963, the 30s, the 1890s, the 1850s, my point being that in every generation, Members of the dominant group have said there is no problem. And in every generation, without fail, we have been wrong. And in every generation, people of color, those who are the targets of that oppression and subordination, have said there is a problem. And in every generation, without fail, they have been right. So the question for us today is what are the odds, honestly, that people of color who have never gotten it wrong have suddenly lost their frickin' minds and have suddenly become unable to see truth and to separate it from fiction and counter to that, what are the odds that white folks who have never gotten it right yet have suddenly become highly, highly perceptive? The odds are pretty long, and again, it's not because white folks are insensitive or hard-hearted, let alone stupid, but it is that those of us who are white have the luxury of not knowing black and brown truth. We don't know because we don't have to know. We are not tested on it. If I don't know what people of color experience, what happens to me in this country? Virtually nothing. But if people of color don't know my reality, if people of color don't know white reality, better than white folks have to know it. If they cannot regurgitate it to us better than we would ever be able to regurgitate it to ourselves, all hell breaks loose. So people of color are going to have to know white history, white literature, white art, white theater, white poetry, white drama. I know we don't call it that. That's sort of the point. When your stuff is the stuff against which everybody else's stuff is compared and found lacking, you don't have to name it. It's just the norm. That's why, for those still confused, we don't have White History Month, because we have several. They go by the tricky names of May and June, July, August, September. Pretty much any month that we have not designated as someone else's month, that's White History Month. But we take it for granted because we don't have to know other folks' reality. That's a privilege. That's an advantage. That's a head start. And it's one we must think about. See, that's the other piece of this, right? It's one thing for white folks to acknowledge racism. Because, you know, white liberals will. God bless. White liberals will acknowledge that racism is real. Oh, my goodness. We should do something about that. Yes, yes, we should. Um, <laughs> It's terrible, that racial profiling, that, that housing discrimination. My goodness, it's awful. Yes, yes, yes it is. Um, but just because we acknowledge racism and discrimination doesn't mean that we'll necessarily acknowledge the flip side of that. Doesn't mean that we will acknowledge that for everyone who's targeted by that discrimination, which we're willing to admit exists, there is somebody else not being targeted, guess whom, and that those individuals are elevated by definition and receive an advantage, receive a subsidy, receive a privilege in the process. You see, we like to talk about those who are down as if there is no up, 
right? We like to use language that obscures the interrelationship of down and up. Now, down has no meaning without an up. It is a relative term. But we talk about those at the bottom of the hierarchy not paying attention to the fact that for anyone who's down, someone is above them, and they're above them because they're down. We use this language that makes it impossible. And when I say we, I don't mean like right-wing folk. I ain't even talking about them. I'm talking about nice, liberal, caring service providers. Right. People who just want to help. Right. I just want to help the underprivileged. That's the word we use. I've used it before. I don't use it anymore, except in a speech like this. Right. We just want to help the underprivileged. But what's wrong with that word, folks? At least two things that ought to be pretty obvious to you. Right. Number one is it's a passively constructed term. Right. It's the passive voice, as my English teacher would say. Underprivileged doesn't imply that anybody did anything to anyone. It's just, there's privilege, and I will be damned. There you are under it. <laughs> if we could just figure out how you got down there. We could solve all the problems of the Western world. But we don't want to know how you got down there. No, that's why we came up with that bumper sticker. Stuff happens. That's the G-rated version. <laughs> that's a bumper sticker that only, only a straight, white, upper-middle-class male could have made. Because anyone who isn't straight, anyone who isn't male, anyone who isn't white, anyone who isn't upper middle class knows that stuff doesn't just happen. Stuff gets done by people to people. Nothing is a coincidence. Nothing is random. It isn't osmosis. And so we act as if it's some passive thing, but yet that's not the case. And the second problem with the term underprivileged is even bigger than the first one, is it's a relative term. Again, this is grammar. Man, you don't like this? You can disagree with anything else I say tonight. If you have a problem with this piece right here, you must take it up with your third grade grammar teacher because it is not on me. If we use the word underprivileged, then by definition there must be an overprivileged, but we don't use that word in polite conversation. Indeed, it doesn't exist in any dictionary to be found on the planet. If you don't believe me, go back to your res hall, go back to your apartment, go back to your home, go back to your place of employment. And tomorrow, I want you to punch in two little words. The first one, underprivileged. Make no mistake, your spell check is going to recognize that word. It's in their dictionary. They can give you the definition. They can give you the synonym. They can give you the antonym. They can show you the phonetic way in which you should spell it. Now, come down one line, type in the word overprivileged, and watch how fast that little red line pops up. That line which says, mm, nope, you're an idiot. <laughs> Making up words that don't exist. Try again and get back to us. But if there's an underprivileged, there must be an overprivileged. Why don't we talk about it? Because that would require that we acknowledge that if there are two to three million people being targeted for race-based housing discrimination because they are people of color every year, that is two to three million more places I can live. If people of color are being targeted and profiled and I'm not, that is an advantage. It may or may not have material consequences. A lot of privilege isn't about material acquisition. So please know this. When I talk about white privilege, I don't even mean money necessarily. For some, it definitely translates to that. For some, it has certainly meant that. But even for those white folks who don't have that money, white privilege is real at the psychological level. First of all, I would say from my standpoint that there are some African Americans that are African, but from my take and my family and many others, we don't identify with having to come from Africa. I have no ties to Africa, none whatsoever, with the past 13 generations that I can name on my mother and father's side, my ancestors. I can't find any African in that link back to that time. So having said that, no. But what most people don't understand is Native American slavery. And Native American slavery was two to 300 years ahead before the first African hit these shores. Most folks don't understand that because they're given the perception that Indian-owned slaves 
and they show you the Cherokees owning slaves. But what they don't say, one of the major Cherokee slave owners, John Ross, they said was one eighth or one sixty four Cherokee. So if you ask me, if I calculate that up, that is a Caucasian. According to his history, he could not even speak Cherokee. So folks must understand the dynamics of Caucasians being a symbol among tribes and leading these tribes and they understand that from that standpoint. Now, let's deal with 1682 and I'm going to start in Virginia. I spent the past 10 years studying colonial law as it deals with Native Americans and as it deals with reclassifications of race. So in 1682, Virginia decided to create two acts. And the act that we're going to deal with, Virginia said Native Americans or Indians and Africans will be placed under the umbrella of Negro. That started in Virginia. Negro was a Portuguese term used to describe indigenous people. So in the colonial time in America, you had Indian Negroes and you had African Negroes. Now, South Carolina adapted that and came up with something called the Negro Law of South Carolina. If you go and Google the Negro Law of South Carolina, you will find this congressional record. And it talks about Indians as well as Africans, free people of color, free Africans, free Indians. But what history doesn't also tell you there were European Negroes, which were British slaves that were in South Carolina colonial times. That's a history not even talked about. So now we're going to go back and we're going to deal with the Indian Negroes who were in slavery. Because what happens today when historians start talking and activists start talking, and they're telling about African Americans in the 16, 17, 18, early 1900s. I have an issue with that because who are you talking about? Because that term did not exist. So you have to deal with the definition. So understanding this from a forensic standpoint, Negro in colonial times, you were talking about two different sets of people. You were talking about the Americans, the Indians, and you were talking about the Africans. In slavery, and I use the term like mixing fruit cocktails, because after the slavery, everybody is colored, or everybody is black. And please keep in mind, black is not a race. It is a color. It is looked upon as being a race, then accepted as being a race. It is a color. So folks really need to understand this. I deal with my necessity of who I am. I am a Yuchi Indian. And my grandmother and my grand aunt and my grandfather and my parents made sure I never forget it. I drank it day in and day out. My aunt will always say, we may be called black, but we ain't come from Africa. We from right here. The Yuchi Indians have been on the Savannah River for over a thousand years in the Ogishi River. 
thousands of years. When the first Europeans came and saw us, they say these people have the hue of the Ethiopian and the Egyptian. So what does that say? So they were compared. Because they don't know the history of Native American slavery. And South Carolina, South Carolina, listen to me, brother, listen to me carefully. South Carolina has the most pristine records of Native American slavery and colonial race reclassification than any other state. Now, as I speak tonight, I speak from South Carolina. But keep in mind, Georgia was created out of South Carolina, and Alabama was created out of Georgia. So in the beginning, it was the Carolinas. But a lot of people don't realize, again, that a lot of the Spanish Moors and Morocco, who granted South Carolina their first charter as an independent sovereign state, thousands of years. When the first Europeans came and saw us, they say these people have the hue of the Ethiopian and the Egyptian. So what does that say? So they were compared. Because they don't know the history of Native American slavery. And South Carolina, South Carolina, listen to me, brother, listen to me carefully. South Carolina has the most pristine records of Native American slavery and colonial race reclassification than any other state. Now, as I speak tonight, I speak from South Carolina. But keep in mind, Georgia was created out of South Carolina, and Alabama was created out of Georgia. So in the beginning, it was the Carolinas. But a lot of people don't realize, again, that a lot of the Spanish Moors and Morocco, who granted South Carolina their first charter as an independent sovereign state, helped colonize the Carolinas. South Carolina created a law in the 1600s called the Moore Sundry Act. And what this act did, it classified free African as white. So on the census, you got to be very careful because now I'm speaking to you from a forensic genealogy, a forensic genealogist point of view. Your ancestors, depending on who they are, if you know who they are, may be coded as white on the census when you go back and do your genealogy search and you think you've got the wrong person. No, you have the right person if you have the location. Majority of them were slave owners. They held property. What are one of the ways, what are one of the ways, Alonzo, is that a reverb on my end? Yeah, yeah, that's an echo. echo. Uh, let me, let me let cut the game down. down. What about now? Sound Hello? Better. Yeah, that's better. Oh, okay, Alonzo, what about, why... Is this this seems to be one of what you're talking about now seems seems to be one of the ways that there is so much confusion and animosity in the community by the way you're explaining it. Could that be the reason? We're not the same people. We never were the same people. We were all combined. Those that were slaves, those that were not. So after the end of slavery, let me explain something else about South Carolina. Explain it. Could that be the reason? What about now? Uh, Hello? Yeah, that's better. Uh, Okay. Alonzo, what about why 
is this this seems to be one of what you're talking about now seems seems to be one of the ways that there is so much confusion and animosity in the community by the way you're explaining it. Could that be the reason? We're not the same people. We never were the same people. We were all combined, those that were slaves, those that were not. So after the end of slavery, let me explain something else about South Carolina. South Carolina, when they came in to enslave, they conquered entire villages. Villages might have five, ten thousand people. Could be forty, fifty, sixty, maybe a hundred thousand acres. And those native villages became plantations. And those plantations today are townships and cities. In the early stage of Native American slavery, when they started bringing the Africans over, they didn't enslave them on the same plantation. That only happened at a different time. Native Americans enslaved the whole village. No one's going to run away. Now, what you got to understand, when you go do your research now, you have to look at what type of plantation this was. Was it a cotton plantation? Was it a rice plantation? Or a sugarcane plantation? 98% of your sugar plantations are your Native American slaves. Your cotton plantations are your African slaves. And your rice plantations. You have to investigate the plantation owner because they had to have permits. Did he have a permit to own Native American slaves? Did he have a permit to own African slaves? Or did he have a permit for British slaves, Scottish, and the Irish? These things are very key. Now, South Carolina did a whole lot of domestic slave trading with Native Americans, which means many of your ancestors ended up into Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and other places in the West Indies because that was a domestic trade. Well, you said, well, how is that a domestic trade and that's not part of the United States? I'm sorry, because in the 1600s, South Carolina had a governor named Governor Linton. Henry Linton. Henry Linton was the governor of Jamaica and South Carolina and governed certain parts of the Barbados because all of that was a part of the South Carolina province. That's why you won't find any slave trade direction coming from the United States going to the islands. It won't be on the transatlantic slave because it's domestic. So we have to understand that. So as you go do your genealogy search, that is very important. The other thing to keep in mind is to study the immigration maps. Where did the slave want to come from? Because in South Carolina, South Carolina had about 274 pre-African slave owners. So you have to understand why wasn't this information given? You got to go back and look at reconstruction. What were they trying to reconstruct? Then after reconstruction, we get Jim Crow. We get laws that saying colleagues can't read, can't go to school, can't become policemen, can't be judges. Why? So you will go into the public records and find out that before the Civil War, your ancestors may have been land owners. Your ancestors may have been slave owners and not vice versa. Your ancestors may have fathered white children and they were the slave masters, besides it being vice versa. Can't go to school, can't become policemen, can't be judges. Why? So you will go into the public records and find out 
that before the Civil War, your ancestors may have been landowners? Your ancestors may have been slave owners and not vice versa? So you will go into the public records and find out that before the Civil War, your ancestors may have been landowners? Your ancestors may have been slave owners and not vice versa? Your ancestors may have fathered white children and they were the slave masters, decided being vice versa? These are things folks need to be concerned about because the average genealogist don't teach this. But I'm telling you this from a forensic standpoint. You look at your slave manifest. Your slave manifest are the logs that tell you where the slave going, who owned the slave, what color is the slave. If you read the slave manifest, you will see slaves that are gold, that are yellow, that are black, that are white, that are brown, that are tan. So we need to keep in mind. So just so happened, the color black stuck for some reason. Where are the slaves going? Who else? Your slave manifests are the logs that tells you where the slave going, who owned the slave, what color is the slave. If you read the slave manifest, you will see slaves that are gold, that are yellow, that are black, that are white, that are brown, that are tan. So we need to keep in mind. So just so happened, the color black stuck for some reason. You got to keep in mind with that because these things are very, very important. Another thing that I teach and I tell people all the time, you got to be careful with the size of the slave ship. Folks don't really understand. Say, what do you mean by that, Langley? Okay, along the Savannah River, the channels are very narrow. I can swim from one side to the other in probably two minutes. So the channel is no more than about 25 or 30 yards. So you're not going to get no ship down there. You're going to get a boat because the draft is not going to carry it. And how many people on the little boat going down there? 25, 30 maybe? It wasn't no two, 300, not in that area. So you have to question now, where did all these massive ships come from? Not mainland inside of America. No, may have been certain amount of size of ships going to the Caribbean? No. It's impossible. These are facts because if you read the slave manifest, they tell you the capacity of the ship, the size of the ship. These things are very, very important. Of course, the cotton trade down in Beaufort, it tells you. And in Charleston, where are these slaves coming from? Why was cotton so important, Egyptian cotton? Because the African, the capacity of the ship, the size of the ship. These things are very, very important. Of course, the cotton trade down in Beaufort, it tells you. And in Charleston, where are these slaves coming from? Why was cotton so important, Egyptian cotton? 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 Important. 
for the cotton trade down in Beaufort, it tells you. And in Charleston, where are these slaves coming from? Why was cotton so important, Egyptian cotton? Because the Africans knew how to grow it. Wasn't for the Africans, wouldn't be no cotton here. So the British loved cotton. And there were seven African nations that are listed in South Carolina congressional records that had to do with slavery and participated and sent their people over here as well as other tribes. And they sent people over here, these tribes who knew how to grow cotton, knew how to deal with iron and very other tasks. These were specialists that they sent over here. You have to understand, slavery had nothing to do with black or white. It had to do with capitalism at that time. Jim Crow made it about black and white and racism. I checked the law. I looked at the record to see how far, how far, when you look to see how many people were hung in slavery days, the numbers was very low because the slave was your property and they had to have insurance on slave and their cost. Your African slave was your Rolls Royce. But after slavery and in the years of Jim Crow, hanging and lynching, according to the record, expanded over 500 to 1,000 percent, depending on where you are. They weren't trying to kill their slaves. So I have to question certain parts of roots and certain events that happened. Because from a scientific perspective and what's in the colonial records, certain events didn't take place. Yes, slavery happened. It did. But the multitude of five, six thousand people, four or five hundred people on a big slave ship coming down the Savannah River, no, you can't sit in an airplane for eight hours without having to get up and stretch. So you mean to tell me you're going to chain someone down in a boat and cross the Atlantic for four months and their muscles are not being utilized. And they're going to get off the ship when they arrive and start picking cotton. Any medical doctor will tell you, mm, I don't think about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're tonight, we're with Chief Lonzo Lamy from the UG. From the House of Representatives, the 59th Congress, Second Session, Citizenship of the United States, Expatriation, and Protection Abroad, Letter from the Secretary of State, Submitting Report on the Subject of Citizenship, Expatriation, and the Protection Abroad. Page 459, Section Morocco. Morocco. Sir, there are strictly speaking no Moroccan laws relating to the citizenship of Moorish subjects in Morocco. The fundamental laws of this non-Christian country are
based entirely upon the Islamic code, no part of which treats of the subject of citizenship. Page 460. There are, however, numerous treaties and conventions between the various Christian countries and the Moorish Empire by means of which citizenship in this country is defined. But as I understand from the above acknowledged instructions that it is not the desire of the department to call for a report upon such lines, I will therefore confine these remarks to general conditions existing, which may possibly be of some use in connection with the information desired. Section one. Citizenship in Morocco may be said to be governed by the laws pertaining to the same in other countries, with the exception that all persons residing in Morocco who cannot prove foreign citizenship or protection are considered ipso juer as Moorish subjects. Two and three. Moorish subjects lost their nationality only by becoming naturalized in or protected by another country having treaty relations with the Moorish Empire. It was established by the Convention of Madrid, concluded July 3rd, 1880, as follows. Article 15. Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country and who shall return to Morocco shall, after having remained for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligation to quit Morocco unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. Foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall be continued to head them as regards all its effects without any restriction. The above ruling has never yet been acted upon and should this at any time be contemplated seriously a large number of naturalized people American and others residing in Morocco would be affected thereby. Four and five, residence in foreign parts does not affect the nationality of Moorish subjects and the Moorish government has no means of protecting its subjects permanently residing in other countries with the exception of a so-called Moorish consul at Gibraltar and a Moorish agent at Cairo, Egypt. I am ETC Hoffman Philip. Google United States Code, Title 22, Chapter 2, Section 141. Consular Courts. Act August 1st, 1956. Repealed sections 141 to 143, effective upon the date which the president determined to be appropriate for the relinquishment of jurisdiction of the United States in Morocco. Jurisdiction of the United States in Morocco was relinquished by memorandum of President Eisenhower dated September 15, 1956. Notice was given to Morocco on October 6, 1956 and all pending cases were disposed of by 1960. See Bulletin of the State Department, Volume 35, colon 909, page 844. Sections 141, RS, sections 4083, 4,125, 4,126, 4,127, Act June 14, 1878, Chapter 193, 20, Statute 131, related to judicial authority generally of ministers and consuls of United States in China, 
Siam, Turkey, Morocco, Muscat, Abyssinia, Persia, and territories formerly part of the Ottoman Empire, including Egypt. It's, uh, Bashar, and he also knows that North America or the America North America is known as Al Maghreb Al Aqsa. Of course, I know that North America was known as Al Maghreb Al Aqsa, and it reported to the Sultan of Morocco. And there was a relation. This is why I needed to ask you, what's the relation between the first, you know, colonials and the uh, uh, governors of Morocco because they con con communicated because in on paper it was part of greater Morocco and that's it, known that's known but I, I, I need Bashar's to know from Jordan yes Palestinian yes and he Palestinian, knows this. Jordanian, Arab, Canadian <laughs> <laughs> fantastic <laughs> Seed. We know that we one of the seeds of Moses. Yeah. So, 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 so you're from. So, where are you from again? I was born in. I was born in the island Martinique, French island. Mm -hmm. and of course, we are descendant of from Egyptian. 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 Yes. Okay. So over there, they still re re refer to our people as Moors, correct? Yes. Sir. So why do you think over here in America, these same people who are brought from the same land, yes, sir. when we tell them that they're Moors, what what why, why do you think that is? Because why? Because the, uh, uh, after so many generations, if it's not cast down, you will lose. So therefore, listen good what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. A man that do not know his own identity, when he is giving one, he will simply believe. Mm -hmm. He will simply believe what he's not. You're right. So therefore, you will act as a stranger to your own identity. Because you only believe on somebody else, so you that. Yeah. So you act opposite to truly what you are. Yeah.